Welcome to the Effortless Swimming Podcast. My guest today is Frank Huseman. He is a swim coach based in the Netherlands uh, and you run Tri Experience. You work with a lot of athletes similar to myself that are adults, they're triathletes uh, and don't necessarily come from a, a swimming background. And we originally got in contact with each other, each other when I sent an email out, out about the EO Swim Better which is the smart paddle device that measures the force and the direction of it. And we're ex- you were asking some questions about it uh, because you were using something similar. And what uh, when we did get on the call, we found out that you'd done some work with Christian Blumenfeld, who, for those that are listening, he got third in Kona on the weekend just gone. Uh, and so I thought it'd be great to, first of all, jump in and see what were some of those insights that you got from working with Christian about his his swimming. So first of all, welcome. And then uh, it'd be great to get your insight into Christian Blumenfeld's stroke. Yeah. Thank you, Brent, for having me here on uh, on your podcast. Um, yeah. Well, let me introduce uh, Marcel the bit and the reason uh, why I got to uh, basically work with, with, with Christian for a bit. Um, basically, I am uh, I'm asked for uh, the Boer wetsuits uh, on a regular basis as a swim coach to test and improve their wetsuits. Because, uh, you know, my background is swimming, I'm a swim coach. And, uh, uh, well, coincidentally, uh, uh, Alex de Boer, the founder of the Boer Wetsuits, is, is, a, is a great friend of mine. So, um, what we did uh, last year, uh, we went to uh, Bergen uh, to meet up with Christian and, uh, and Olaf Alexander, his coach. Uh, to test Christian uh, uh, in his swimming and also to test his uh, how he he is reacting on a different kind of uh, support uh, uh, in in wetsuits. So we did all kinds of experiments on Christian, which was very fun, uh, with all kinds of neoprene accents in wetsuits and, and, and test what the effect was of his uh, swimming performance and uh, his energy, energy expenditure. Uh, of course, we did this. Uh, uh, the, the, the goal was to uh, develop a wetsuit for Christian, which was ideal to do and swim the, the sub-7 project in uh, to get him into the fastest time uh for the swim actually um so and basically what what uh what i as a swim coach was surprised that christian has a basically a, a fairly good level uh a very good swim level for a triathlete and um, if you're speaking in terms of uh, olympic swimmers uh, of course, that is a, a different ballpark. Um, also, in in a, uh, in swim speed, of course, but also um, efficiency. Uh, the thing we found with Christian is that uh, he was able to he is able to uh, maintain a basically a high power output or a high uh, and a high cadence for a long time. And it's, I think that's also uh, uh, within the other uh, disciplines, the cycling and, uh, and the running is one of his uh, strengths as well. And that's why he's probably so good. Um, well, I, I can share some of the uh, things we tested, we found uh, that might, might give you some insights. So let me switch. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be good. And, yeah. uh, and one of the things I remember you mentioning was he he hasn't and this was tested with a, a wetsuit on as well. So like the stroke can obviously change a bit there, but one of the things that stood out was he hasn't got a really he hasn't got a long reach or, or glide time out the front. He was pretty quickly moving into the into the catch. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the other things that I found interesting too is that you with these devices you look at impulse time. And when I first yeah. heard that term. I or the overall impulse, yeah. I, I was like, what, you know, what's what's impulse time? Uh, but I guess the way that I would explain it, and I'd like to get your take on it too, is it's essentially how how long have you first of all got got that contact with the water through your catch in your pool, 
And yep. then what what's the overall, uh, I guess, uh, if you look at the the graph of when of the power, yep. how much impulse have you got? How how much and uh, does that sort of fill up the the space there? Uh, yep. I've obviously butchered that uh, that description, but that's that's how I would sort of see impulse time. What, could you talk a bit about how you you view impulse, so that someone who may not come from a swimming background and hasn't spent the last 20, 20 years of their uh, career coaching. Yeah. How could you explain it in, in simple terms? Yeah, the, it, basically, uh, scientifically, the impulse is the force that you apply uh, multiplied by the time that you apply the force. That's the impulse you mm. create. And to be able to swim fast, the only way, it's very simple. Basically, swimming, it's... it's, 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 it's uh, so it's very simple because it's all science. So you only move forward if you if you put pressure or force uh, with your basically as your propulsion surfaces, which is the hand and the underarm, in the in the backward direction. Right. So any other mm -hmm. movement, and you we can debate about that. What uh, if you need to have a deep catch or a shallow catch, or you know um, and. Well, we used to basically, I was still schooled also in making an S pattern because we want to, we want to push water that was not moving and therefore create a bigger, uh, force, but you know, any other movement that you make that is not in a backward direction is a loss. So, uh, because that will, the only way that you're moving forward is to press water in the backwards direction direction with as basically as much force and uh in the longer path so um that's that's funny and i i i recently saw a documentary i was it was also a dutch guy who who uh a dutch a dutch olympic athlete who uh was getting into the uh the techniques of Usain Bolt, why he is running that fast. And basically, uh, this is also scientific. The speed is determined by two major things. Speed is, is the product of stroke rate and stroke length. And any other element is impacting those two. So, hmm. uh, you know, if you're having a, a poor body position, Right. And so you have more drag in the water that has an immediate impact on your stroke length. So your travel distance per stroke is impacted, impacted negatively. Right. Mm. Because there's, so if you put away that, if you don't change anything about your swimming technique, but you put away that, or you, you, you pull away that, uh, uh, you take away that drag or minimize the drag, for example, by putting on a wetsuit or a buoyancy short or whatever, putting the body up higher, then suddenly you see that the travel distance per stroke is uh, increased by 25, 30% or so. Um, and then the stroke rate. The only thing with swimming is, and those, it's that stroke rate and, and stroke length, they also impact each other into a certain extent. And it depends on what kind of level swimmer you are. Uh, you can increase your stroke rate quite a bit without decreasing in stroke length. Uh, if you have, if you're a, st a starter swimmer and you start to really, you know, increase stroke rate, then the stroke length, because there's, well, the technique is maybe not that good, uh, body position is not that good, and the, the body is not trained that well the stroke length will mm -hmm. decrease immediately. So the it's, impulse... It's a really good way to keep things simple, isn't it? With If you just like, oh, how can I get faster? It's like, well, you can reduce drag to uh, to increase your stroke length or you can increase your propulsion so it's yep. better catch and pull and better connection yep. with the with the body. And then the other factor is, is stroke rate. So there's a number of things in there. There's heaps of things in there that you can do to, to find ways to swim faster. And... Yep usually the first place that I would start would be reducing drag. That's you know, because you, you could have yep. the best catch in the, in the world. You could have the highest stroke rate, but if your hips and legs are dropping down, 
yeah. you're not going to get you're not going to be going fast so yeah. there's so many things that you can do and i think for a lot of people it's just understanding what what those things are and then maybe yeah. which which order should you go about them yeah yeah well and basically the the the, the biggest trait is for a, a swimmer to when you start to uh, to get into the, the swim sport and, and starting to learn the freestyle. The, the main goal is, and you probably need a couple of years for this, is to get your, uh, uh, to get your swim efficient. Because uh, if you take a look at, for example, swimming is, uh, we call it a, 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 cycle, uh, a cycle sport, basically. You know, you do a movement and it's completed, uh, basically it's rep, it's, it's, uh, it repeats all the time, all the time, all the time. And, um, uh, cycling is the same and running is the same. So if you want to become a efficient runner or cyclist, we know that you first have to work on uh, cadence. And if you, you know, you can move in a certain cadence. You have an efficient movement movement pattern, then you can start uh, putting on an extra gear, and then you go faster, or uh, make your step a little bit longer, and then you go faster. Swimming is because we are we are moving in water, which is seven hundred seventy five times the density of air. It's incredible, seven hundred seventy five the density of air. So can you, it's if you if you if you go on a time trial bike and you you cycle 40k an hour um uh, that speed it is very important uh, that you have like an uh, a good aero dynamic position right because if you get up it immediately impacts speed so we're not swimming 40k an hour but if you're never a swimmer you swim 4k an hour so that's a 10 it's a mult, mult, it's ten, 10 times slower, but you do that in a medium, which is water, which is 775 times more dense. Mm. So, uh, air, uh, in swimming, the aqua dynamics is like, if you, if you, yeah, uh, divide it by 10 aqua dynamics is about 80, 75 to 80 times more important than aerodynamics in, in cycling. Hmm. So if you want to be a good swimmer, the first thing you have to work on is uh, keep your drag low, yeah, your body drag. So, and also every movement that you make uh, will amplify, if you, if you do it in the incorrect way, it will amplify, it will immediately increase your uh, body resistance. Yeah. Mm. So if you're swimming and you're breathing and you're losing your balance and one feet comes out and it comes out of your body alignment, then it immediately, uh, that kick on the side is immediately causing, uh, a decrease of speed because it's causing drag. Mm. So uh, that's why it's so important. So if you want to be, become a good swimmer, you first have to work on stroke length only. And if you were able to keep a good stroke length, a healthy stroke length for about, let's say one or two K continuously, uh, then start to work on speed. That's, mm. that's, that's my, my, uh, uh, basically vision and experience. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I'd agree as well because you, uh, but the, and the one, the one thing I'd note there for those that are listening is that we're talking about stroke length, you know, you want to reduce your, your stroke count, but not to the <laughs> point where you're overreaching and over rotating and, and doing these really big, long strokes where you're just going too far with it. The yeah. way that I would often explain it to someone is if you were to do a 50 meter swim and you were to try and have, have your, your lowest stroke count without stopping and pausing, you were just swimming at a, a normal rhythm and tempo. Yep. That's what we want to try to maintain as you, yep. as you go for those longer distances, um, not where you're just trying to overreach and, you know, have your, let's say your stroke count is normally 40. You don't want to be going down to 34 where you're actually going much slower because you're, you're over gliding. 
Um, so that's just one one thing to note when you're you're going for it. Yep. And with Agreed. reducing drag, so the thing that I come across, and I'd be interested to hear if if you hear this too, head position is obviously important, and you want to make sure you've got the right head position. But a lot of the beginner swimmers that I come across think it's the only thing that's impacting their body position. So in order to get their hips up and their legs up, they will bury their head in the water. They'll go very deep and yep. they'll be swimming with it too far under the water at times. Yep. So the, it's just one factor that impacts body position. What are some of those other things that that you see as impacting body position? Uh one thing, if uh, what I see most head position, of course, is one thing, and it has to do with breathing. And what what I, what the most of beginner swimmers they want to you know get out of the water to breathe. So you want to get up. So if you pull your head up, your hips sink, and your legs are attached to the hips, so they sink as well. So uh, that causes immediately it 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 moves you out of the horizontal position, and it causes drag. Uh, you can also correct it, of course, put your head in the water and put your complete head on the water. But you know, the surface of the, of the skull is quite, uh, quite big as well. So it also causes frontal drag. And also if you put your head down, uh, there's a strain on the back, which enables or prevents you to move and to stretch out, uh, freely, because if there's mm. too much tension there. It will hold you back. So uh, that's also a cause. But the yeah. the most, I think the most common thing I see is a uh, not uh, straight hips. So a little slightly bent hip. And if you have a slightly bent hip, then that will mean that the kick will be uh, more from the knee. If the kick is coming from the knee, then the the effect of the of the kick is well. I always say. You have, you need to have, uh, uh, you need to have an active kick because if you don't kick, you, uh, the, the legs are too low basically and causing drag, but the kick is very difficult because, uh, there is like, it's, it's, it's working in a positive way or it's working in a negative way. So you do it correctly and it uh, benefits you, but if you do it incorrectly, uh, you know, it's called you're causing drag. So, mm. um, and you can work uh, with kick techniques and uh, do all kinds of exercises. But the first thing people need, and especially if I have runners, <laughs> if I have runners who want to have the to learn to freestyle, they have a very hard time in keeping their hips straight. And what what exercises would you have them do to start to to train that and to get familiar with the the movement and the way they need to hold their body, their core, and their hips to be kicking effectively? Well, the, the, a good exercise is uh, I put them uh, a land exercise. Uh, I, I do supermans. I call them the swimmer supermans because it's not the original supermans. But if you, I lie them on the back on a. Uh, on a, on a mat besides the pool and then lift your feet and your hands up five centimeters. And then your, uh, your whole body, basically the hips are the lowest point. If you, if the hips, if you're lying in the water like this and the hips are the lowest points then your, you know, body position is very, it's very, very good. Uh, and that's basically a good base. It doesn't mean that you have to be that all the time, but there should be this tension. And there's, there's one trick I learned. This is like also a little bit aquadynamics. So if, if the, if the body position has this surface, there's tension on this surface, then the body will float. If this, if the tension is on the backward, then the body will sink. So you need to have mm -hmm. the tension on the, in the freestyle, uh, on the front, front side of the body. So the chest and the belly. So. So in that way, the hips should be the, lo the longest point or, and you wouldn't see that if you see a, a experienced swimmer, you, you wouldn't catch that immediately because of course the body, you know, they're so well trained and they're moving quickly. You don't see that, but, uh, for a beginner swimmer, that's, I think the one of the biggest, uh, uh, tips is 
get in, you, you don't have to look like a banana in the water, but the tension should be on that side. Then you will float. And from that, from that, from that bottom position, start a kick with a straight leg and a loose ankle. Uh, then your kick will come, uh, from the hips. It doesn't feel like that. Uh, and you, you may have a slightly bent knee in kicking downwards, only you should have a, uh, a straight leg in the upward movement. Mm. So. Uh, for those, for those that are listening, uh, you're showing that, that position with your, with your hand and the, the correct way there is thinking of it like you talked about a banana almost like a, a dish or a plate that sort of, you know, will rise up at, on the edges there. Yeah. Holding your body that way will allow you to, to essentially you float a bit better. Yeah. And I remember when we had our Hawaii camp a couple of years ago, uh, the coach I had with me, uh, Gary Hurring, was getting the swimmers to practice floating. And though, uh, and if you are trying to float, so you're face down in the water and you're trying to float with your hands below your body and your legs below your body, it's not going to happen for you. As soon as you try and lift your hands above your head and yep. your legs above your hips and torso, that's yep. when you're actually able to, to float, which is, which is what you're talking about yep. there, which is an interesting way of uh, thinking about it. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good uh, because obviously you know, a lot of people do bend too much at their hips and their waist because they're not used to holding their body that way. It's not something yep. that they would be doing in any other activity probably. So yep. it's, um, it's an interesting, interesting concept. I like it. Yep. Yeah, I guess I have, I have some I have a nice picture. It's uh, it's uh, uh, or a nice footage of a swimmer. It's doing in the slow mo. It's an Olympic swimmer. It's Ferry Wiersman, he's uh, Olympic gold medalist on the 10k open one swim in Rio. Uh, a very exceptional swimmer because he's a long distance swimmer. But he he used to have a national record on the 400 short course as well. So he's mm. quite fast on the on the on the mid distances. And also in the marathon, he, uh, the 10K is very good as well. And his trade as a, basically, his strength is as a long distance swimmer that he has still a very active kick. So he's by far, he doesn't have a passive kick. And uh, it, it's, it's usually said or debated that a, a triathlete or a long distance swimmer should minimize the energy uh, by, by uh, minimize the energy and and the uh, the activity of the legs because that's also you know it's tiring you have to run and you have to cycle uh, afterwards uh, but if you perform the kick uh, in the right way it doesn't cost that much energy not at all mm. uh, but it has a, a fair con a fair positive contribution contribution to the complete stroke so a good a good kick and a good timed kick is basically supporting uh the the glide phase it is supporting the body roll basically uh the suppressing the stroke uh, but also if you're really able to to uh to get to, to to bring that into practice you can um the Basically, when I say the 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 least uh, the parts of the body which are on the least resistance, you can use those to drive your tempo. Maybe you've heard of the running arms. So a marathon runner uh, that is you know uh, getting into the last part of the race, last ten k, he really has to activate the arms to get you know the legs are tiring. They want to slow down to get the legs driving. It was, uh, it was a nice thing it's, uh, when Eliud Kipchoge did his uh, first try to get on the sub two in Monza. Uh, he was in the last two rounds and he was on the edge of barely making it or not. And Skos was, was next to him is cycling. It says, okay, use your arms active, you know, keep your arms active because your cadence is dropping. So he activated arms and he could be able, he was able to keep his cadence high. The same thing with swimming. If, if you're a, a competent swimmer, you can basically uh, steer your stroke, stroke rate or manage your stroke rate of your, and also the length of your stroke by increasing 
and decreasing the frequency of the kick. Mm. So you can even switch. You can even switch for a long distance swimmer. I always teach them, okay, you uh, basically, if you try to have a six beat kick, but there's also sprinters and they, they decouple the, the kick. They can, they can do 10 kicks or 12 in a stroke cycle. So you can also do four, but that, me that means that there is basically uh, somewhere a, a disturbance. If you have four, a two beat is also, because, you know, we are, um, uh, you know, we move in a way, uh, left arm, right foot, uh, right arm, left foot, you know, that's how we are programmed as humans. So you run in that way, uh, and you swim in that way as well, if you want to be efficient and controlled. Can, can you talk a bit about the, the 10 and 12 beat kick? You're saying that um, some distance swimmers will use that to, for part of their swim to take, to let their arms rest a bit more, or what's the, what are you referring to there? I don't quite fully understand that, that side of it. No, if you took a, if you, if you, if, for example, if you analyze a, uh, a 50, the 50 meter, uh, uh, sprint field, the 50 freestyle of the last Olympics, and you, uh, you slow down the movements there, see how many kicks those guys are making into, into one arm stroke, an arm cycle. It's more than six, right? right. So, yeah. So. For a long distance swimmer, uh, I think that the kick should not be a, uh, uh, the, the kick should be, uh, there's basically there's, there's, there's three reasons why you have kick. The first reason is get your body alignment, right? Yeah. So if your feet are up, if your feet are up, then the, the complete resistance of the bunny is low, right? So that's the first thing the, the, the second reason is coordination. So if you want to move in the, in a human way, left, right, right, left, you should be having a controlled kick rhythm, right? So, uh, if you don't have that, it will disturb your stroke. If you have that, it will, uh, make the stroke easier and more controllable. So it's more natural. And the third one that is propulsion. And, uh, I was working in, in, uh, I've been working in the swim lab in 2013 in Eindhoven in Holland, and we weren't able to test it, but, um, for the Olympic sprinters, we did some, uh, drag measurements and active drag measurements. And we estimated that the contribution of the Olympic sprinter which by far has the, the biggest effort in, 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 in the kick of, of all swimmers, basically that the contribution of the, uh, of the kick, uh, in propul in basically the speed is maximum 15%. So for those guys, 85% is arms. If you take a look at long distance swimmer with an active kick, the contribution of the kick in speed. It's less than 4%. It's less than 4%. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so nine, six percent is arms, hmm. but if you don't use the legs, then you, you, the stroke doesn't coordinate well and your legs will sink and it will cause drag. So you have to use it. So, uh, be, be, so someone could listen, could hear that, uh, and, and think, oh, it's only 4%, so I don't need to worry about my legs. But as you're mentioning there, when you when it's not effective, when it's not working for you, then you're going to be much slower overall. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's why it's an important thing to, to get right. And I, I'll often say to people at, at clinics that we're coaching is that like you, you, don't, you don't want to be kicking hard, especially if you're doing triathlon, but you want to make sure that your kick is, is effective and that yeah. it's not slowing you down because... Yeah. Um, it, it just slows so many people down that, um, it's something that's worth, worth getting right and spending, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, just tweaking some things to make sure that it's, it's not making your life harder. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, and, and over the time that you've coached, 
what are some of the things that you as a coach you felt have um, maybe come up with your own ways of describing things or getting people to achieve certain parts of the stroke because I'm thinking back to when I first started coaching it was getting inputs from other coaches and swimmers and then I think that the more you coach you tend to come up with maybe not completely your own ideas they might not be 100% original but they are an accumulation of all this information and knowledge that you've you've taken on board and then you come out with your own um, ways of perhaps teaching things are there a few that come to mind with you because I'd, I'd love to get your take on that because I I've taken uh, so many things from other coaches and learned from so many coaches yeah. that I like to um, yeah to get their perspective on on different parts of stroke and how they like to teach. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one one thing we already spoke about, you know, is simplify the the swim technique in this concept of of stroke length and stroke uh, frequency that determines speed. So uh, also. What helped me a great bit also is uh, I've, I've been using the chart, the stroke rate and time chart that uh, Swim Smooth uses. Uh, maybe you've heard Swim Smooth Paul Newsom uh, also, basically yeah, uh, a yeah. co colleague of ours. Uh, I can I can share that sheet. This is this is a chart that I use when I uh, when I have some swimmers that are able to swim 100 freestyle. So they, they're in, in basically uh, one of my courses to swim the freestyle and they're able to swim four lanes of 25 meters in one go. I'll have to perform, uh, I'll do that. I'll have them perform this test. Uh, they just swim uh, a 100 meters easy, controlled. And what we do is uh, uh, we time uh, basically the swim time of that 100 meters. And we count strokes uh, based on the co stroke count. Let's say if I have, uh, let's say if I have a swimmer doing 25 strokes and then it's swimming, uh, let's say 140, it will show a dot here somewhere. So 25 strokes. So I have this table here and you can see 21, 25 strokes and I said 140, yeah, 140, which is pretty good time for a beginner. That means there's a stroke rate of 76 strokes per minute. That's quite fast, right? And in this table, if you plot out that 140 and that, seven, that 67 stroke rate, that means that the is, is, is swim time is pretty good, but 25 stroke is way too, too much. So the travel dish, so it's, it's efficient in a way that it's inefficient in a way mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, he is swimming with far too much effort, uh, probably too much drag, uh, high stroke rate with short strokes. And this is a, uh, pace that he isn't able to maintain for long. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other way, and that's what we talked about, what you said as well, uh, stroke length is good but it needs to have a certain balance between uh, stroke length and stroke frequency. On the other hand, if you're swimming the same pace, uh, but you have a stroke of let's say 45, which means if I swim the same pace, 45, which well, let's say 46. So if you swim 140 and 100 meters and you need 16 strokes per lane, 16 strokes and then turn and you spend of course not too much time in the turn but you quickly turn have two or three seconds before the next stroke on the next lane again uh then your stroke rate will be 40 let's say 46 and that's a little bit too low so this is the part where you're over gliding and if you're over gliding you need to basically it's a stand still it's like a stop motion you move you slow down, uh, you, every stroke, you need to pull yourself up again. Uh, that's a good tool to, to <laughs> diagnose where someone's falling short. Uh, uh, is their stroke count too low or yeah. sorry, is their stroke rate too low yeah. or is there, yeah. Or are they doing things where they're, they're inefficient in their yeah. technique and that way you can see what it is to work on. So will you use that tool with someone who, who comes to you and 
you'll see where they are on that chart. And let's say they are, their stroke rate's too high. You'll just work on slowing them down a bit and yeah. work on yeah. things to, yeah. to make yeah. Yeah. It was funny because, uh, you know, in the, when you, I, I had this, this test, for example, for a group yesterday, we did it yesterday. It was very funny. And for the most of the people, if you do not count your strokes, you just swim and you try your best, you just swim. And I had, uh, I had a lady who was a, who was a small lady and she, she needed 30 strokes and her swim time was over two minutes. So she was basically off this chart, off this chart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, also had a guy who swam, he swam 140 with 25 strokes. This example, this same example. So then we started some exercises first with a pool boy, uh, then without a pool boy, just, you know, stroke counting said, okay, let's take the average amount of strokes. We call that X, right? You trap, you now swim, uh, 50 meters in X amount of strokes. So if your average stroke leg or count was 25 and it, of course, in, the, in during the test, it, it's not always 25. They start at 22, 25, 26, 28, or something like that, right? So yeah. you see, so the first first lane is controlled, then mm -hmm. it's less controlled, then the show assurance and the last lane they're struggling. But okay, let's win two lanes with X, exactly the average. And then they start counting. And then suddenly they swim with less, they, they swim with 24 strokes. So after 30 minutes of exercise, I was able to, and they, they, uh, we did, we did the, the cool down swim for one or 200 meters. And those guys are trying, okay, let's do 100. And the guy that, uh, was doing 25 strokes in the test, he did 100 meter, 100 meter very easily in 21 strokes. The lady that needed 30 strokes, she did a 100 meter in 24 strokes. So a six stroke reduction, just because they were counting, they were aware of what they're doing, uh, lengthening the stroke a bit and getting more controlled. So only so the awareness, awareness to them. Yeah. gives improvement already. Mm. That's, that's a, a great example of, um, using that tool, first of all, but also bringing, bringing awareness to what, what those factors of your, your speed are, because most people don't know that when they're, when they're new to the sport and a, a, a good set that, um, I did with the, the squad I, I swim with a couple of weeks ago, um, that I got from a friend of mine actually is we did 10, one hundreds, the first 50 is strong, and this is in yep. a long course pool. So first 50 is strong. And then on the way back, count you going fast, but hold your stroke count for all 10, one hundreds. And there was about 30 seconds rest in between. Yep. And what I, what I found in that set is that, um, I tend to, I got faster as I went through because I was like your body figures, you figure out a way to be able to get more out of each stroke while holding that, that stroke count. And if you do come up, um, in in a stroke count, even if you come up one or two, yep. you know, sometimes your, your times increase because you, you're not moving as well. Like I'm probably holding the same stroke rate, but yeah, there's inefficiencies coming into the stroke. So just having that awareness there of how many strokes you are taking helps you maintain your form and your, your technique. So it's, um, yeah, it's what it, it's, it can be a very good thing to, to focus on. That's, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Also, where I also uh, use is uh, I'll just hand them over a pool boy and grab a set of pedals and then have them swim. And then immediately because of the, the propulsion force, the extra propulsion force you have, and also the pedal in, in the glide stroke, uh, gives you a little bit support in the glide. So the arm, if, if you're a swimmer, they have, have them see that to have, uh, the arm drop too fast in the, in, in the glide. Uh, it, it supports that a bit. So, and then suddenly they suddenly do, uh, three or four strokes less per, per, uh, per pool length. 
And then mm. if you condition yourself in that way of swimming, which is more on stroke length and power, once you take off that paddles and you swim another lane, you suddenly, you're conditioned on the power. So you suddenly start to reach better, grab better, uh, get some more pressure on, maybe uh, the surface is less, but you, you immediately, you, f you want to feel the same pressure. So what you will do is you will uh, accelerate the hand a little bit more to feel the extra pressure. And uh, of course you won't have that, uh, the stroke count of the set that you did with the pedal. But it surely is a, a one or maybe two strokes less than you did before. It's it's like wearing a a parachute or like a sponge out behind you, where you've got that extra drag that gets created, um, but you've it also enhances your you know your, your awareness of those things. Yep. So um, yeah, adding some adding some drag to it or with the paddles, adding that surface area. It's, it can be such a, a great tool for, for teaching those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's excellent. Um, is there any other, any other things that, that have worked well for you coaching athletes on those, those kinds of things? What about, let's say for someone who has a, their stroke rate is too, too low. What approach would you often take there? Oh yeah. That's, that's nice. Is uh, uh, I usually, um, I first try to have them, uh, swim with a little, a couple of strokes more on the lane, just shorten the stroke a little bit. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, you, you can grab, uh, the finished tempo trainer, for example, and, uh, put, uh, the tempo trainer under your, your swim cap and then increase a little bit, bit by bit by bit. Uh, so if you, you know, if you're. Let's say the for a swimmer, and th this, uh, there's no golden number, but if you can see in the chart, the white zone, it's like a zone, right? And mm. if you take a look at the chart again, uh, you see that the, the slower you are, the white zone is getting more narrow. The faster you are, the white zone is getting bigger. So basically, uh, and the white zone is, is where efficiency and effic the efficiency is pretty basically okay. Right. Mm. Um, so if you're a swimmer that does one minute, a one minute hundred freestyle, we now just start, just push off the wall and then swim. Uh, you can be in a white zone with a stroke rate of 70. That's the, the down, basically the bottom side of the of the, of the zone, but also with hundred, mm. right? So, and this, uh, so the, the, the faster you are, the more varieties you see. And that's also the nice thing in swimming. And if you're studying elite swimmers, uh, and as we, as coaches, we certainly, I think each coach has, has a certain, uh, ideal uh, way of swimming the freestyle in efficient or effective way. But if you're, if the level goes up, the variety in, uh, the variety, the, the, the technique and the styles, the variety of styles, they, they, they are much, much greater and they, they are, you know, they're far more different. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good, good point is that, I mean, you look at an Olympic final in the 1500 freestyle and there is so many different, different styles of freestyle there, isn't there? Um, yeah. but then for your beginner swimmers, you know, you, you don't want everyone swimming exactly the same. There are certainly different styles there, but you're right. You, there's a, there's a narrower, narrower band of acceptable, not acceptable, but ways, ways that you would want someone, one swimming. Um, yeah. you, there's yeah, less, less, ways of being creative with the stroke and still swimming fast there. Like is only a few, few different styles there. So that's uh yeah, it's a good, good observation, um, with that. Um, and, and Frank, you, you run a lot of, you do a lot of coaching, obviously where you are, you also run camps similar to, to us. So for those that are listening, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Like what's the, the website for, for try experience and how can someone contact you directly? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, www.tryexperience.com. 
and uh, there will just have all the information. It's 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 a Dutch website, but uh, with Google Translate, you can uh, obviously translate everything. So if there's questions, and, and what have, and what have you got coming up in terms of uh, coaching or, or or squad stuff? Uh, well, we are starting up some new courses, swim courses. Um, we're developing basically what we do is with new insights and new tools, we're developing new courses for uh, a broad variety of, of, of swim levels each, uh, each year. Um, also because, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in the coaching for, uh, for more than 10 years and you do the same thing all the time. <laughs> it's not that, it's not that uh, funny. So you always look to new insights and new methods to, to improve. So for example, mm -hmm. I have, we have developed a, a, uh, a swim module that is called tempo trainer and technique. And the tempo trainer refers to the finished tempo trainer uh, where we use not only the tempo trainer to control pace, but we use the tempo trainer to increase focus on a certain element of the stroke. So, and this came from because my wife, me, my wife is a, uh, a, 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 a trainer of dogs as well. And if you train dogs, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's, it's signal learning, like the Pavlov uh, theory mm. and practice. So actually we're doing with, <laughs> I'm not saying that we, we train the swimmers as dogs, but <laughs> uh, we basically, we, we, we took the, 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 the path lift method into a, uh, into a swim training by using the tempo trainer. So we set the tempo trainer into a controllable beat for, for everybody. Everybody has its own, you know, comfortable, uh, stroke frequency. And from there you can say, okay, uh, you can catch on the beep or focus, push out, uh, give that accent in the push phase on the beep or you, so you can, mm. you can even say, uh, um, you can even play, even place your kick and the kick rhythm in the beep if you really focus. So, uh, and that way you, your focus becomes that part of the, uh, stroke. But also the, the beep doesn't stop. So it's continuous. So it's, it, and then it's, it's, it's very exhausting, not in intensity of the swim, but for people, it's like, it's like a huge focus. They have to, to, yeah, yeah, mentally, to bring up. Yeah. 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 So, and that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, uh, it's a, it's a very fun way to, to, to be and to teach swimmers and triathletes that way and to improve the stroke. Uh, that's really that's, that's, that's really good. I've never thought of it that way or, or heard of it done that way. So um, I've got I've got a tempo train. I just need to replace the battery. So um, it's something that I'll have to try. Yeah, uh, I think that's a that's a great way of going about it. Um, Frank, thanks so much for being on the on the podcast, and uh, no doubt we'll be in in touch in the future. And um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing your insights on the podcast. And yep. for anyone listening, go check out um, Frank's website, which we'll put in the show notes. And uh, especially if you are over in the Netherlands. Um, get in touch with Frank because um, great resource and, and you've had a lot of experience working with a bunch of different swimmers and, um, and I've taken a lot from this podcast. So thanks very much for being a part of it. Yep. Thank you, Brian.